tonight on the season premiere of Unsolved Mysteries, we travel to San Francisco for a stunning special report. A generation ago, the Zodiac Killer terrorized Northern California, striking at random, taunting the police, taking at least five lives. But when the killing abruptly stopped, the memories faded until this. The dramatic arrest of Theodore Kaczynski, the accused Unabomber, changed everything. Two investigators soon challenged the authorities with a remarkable theory. They believe the Unabomber and the Zodiac are the same man, Theodore Kaczynski. It may seem improbable, but the similarities are chilling, and even skeptics admit the evidence is worth debating. Join me for this compelling investigation, as well as these intriguing mysteries. For 14-year-old Trish Zemba, a fall from her horse marked the onset of a rare, often incurable nerve disease. The grim prognosis left her family with little to do but pray for a miracle. A heartless murder in Georgia leads to a dramatic shootout with police. Now a killer is on the run. And from the current case file, two young coeds, two different universities, two baffling disappearances. Stay with us. Perhaps you may be able to help solve a mystery. Here in the San Francisco Bay Area, the paths of two serial killers once crossed and recrossed, seemingly intertwined. Yet the two haunted different decades and had markedly different tastes in murder. An unmatched pair are merely different faces of the same matter. The Unabomber, psychopathic general in a one-man war against society. His targets, anyone even loosely connected to technology. University students, airline officials, computer salesmen. A decade earlier, the Zodiac, he was obsessive and particular. Young couples, moonlit nights, secluded roads. Zodiac had five known victims, though he claimed nearly 40. He was never arrested, never even identified. The Unabomber burst onto the scene in 1978. During an 18-year cross-country reign of terror, he killed three and injured 23. He taunted police with letters, all mailed from in and around the Bay Area. Frustrated officials said it was like chasing a ghost. The Unabomber was seen but once, a sighting that resulted in this notorious portrait. Then, April 1996, a suspect unmasked. FBI agents named Theodore Kaczynski, a 55-year-old ex-mathematics professor, as the elusive killer. The fingerprints were hardly dry on Kaczynski's booking sheet when the case was spun in an entirely new direction by these two men, Mike Rasconi and Doug Oswell, working independently at opposite ends of the country. Then joining forces once their story hit the papers, Rasconi and Oswell had each come up with the same stunning theory. There's a, there's a more even point of similarity. I've concluded that there's a very good likelihood that the Unabomber suspect, Ted Kaczynski, and Zodiac are one and the same. Was the resemblance more than coincidence? Journalists wrote it off as unlikely. To detectives, it was doubtful. But nobody said it was impossible. At the age of 26, Theodore John Kaczynski was a rising star in the world of higher mathematics, one of the youngest instructors ever hired by the University of California, Berkeley. Kaczynski began teaching there in September of 1967. 
The Zodiac crawled out of nowhere a little over a year later. It was a full moon, December 20th, 1968. The Zodiac's first victims were two teenagers parked on a lover's lane near the Bay Area town of Vallejo. Both victims died at the scene. To researchers Mike Rasconi and Doug Oswald, Kaczynski's actions shortly after the murders were the first hint that he could be the Zodiac killer. One month later, on January 20th, 1969, Kaczynski tendered his resignation from Berkeley uh, without any apparent motive. And this astounded the people who worked with him. It was just an inexplicable thing to do. Oswald and Rusconi find an even stronger link to Kaczynski in the Zodiac's next murder, some seven months later. Once again, it was a full moon. Once again, Zodiac targeted two lovers parked on a secluded road near Vallejo. This time, the Zodiac left an eyewitness. One of the intended victims, Mike McGough, survived the shooting and watched the killer drive away. Mike McGough claimed that the man who shot him drove a light tan Chevy. Ted Kaczynski's brother, in a Washington Post interview, claimed that Ted owned a 1967 Chevy Malibu, tan in color, uh, at the time of the killings. It's an interesting comparison. I mean, certainly Ted Kaczynski, the suspect, uh, was at Berkeley uh, roughly at the same uh, time that the Zodiac killings occur. We know both. Uh, enjoyed taunting the police. However, there's many more differences than similarities. After the murders, Zodiac bombarded local newspapers with letters. As a Unabomber would a decade later, Zodiac loaded the envelopes with far more postage than necessary. He teased that his identity would be revealed if authorities could only decipher a three-part coded message. Each section of the cryptogram consisted of letters and astrological symbols arranged according to an unknown formula. Robert Graysmith of the San Francisco Chronicles saw the cryptograms firsthand. The genius of, of uh, Zodiac's cryptograms, first of all, he laid them out like works of art, uh, very perfectly arranged. He would use 16 different symbols for, for uh, the letter E, for instance, and he would not repeat them. He'd go completely through the 16 before he began, which made it very, very difficult. He kept them short, 360 symbols in the longest one that we had. Um, that made it difficult to break. To Oswald and Rusconi, the cryptograms forge yet another link between the Zodiac and Ted Kaczynski. Cryptograms are the toys of mathematicians. Uh, Kaczynski was a highly regarded mathematician. He wasn't just a garden variety mathematician. He was, uh, he was touted as one of the top mathematicians in the country. Ted Kaczynski was interested in very abstract mathematics. There's not a lot of evidence that he was interested in astrology or the radions or local geography or the full moon. Ted Kaczynski is a man of numbers but not the kind of numbers that Zodiac was interested in. When the Zodiac's message was finally deciphered, it proved to be a vile ode to the joys of murder. For the researchers, there was one more connection to Ted Kaczynski. The message was solved all except for the last 18 characters. Now, coincidentally enough, there happens to be 18 letters in the name Theodore J. Kaczynski. So this possibly could be his signature at the end of the letter. It was in these letters that Zodiac introduced his now infamous symbol. Within a few weeks, it would be seen again. So did you pack any more stuff in the basket? Yeah, we've got apples, bananas. September 29, 1969, just north of Berkeley, the Zodiac stalked another couple. Don't worry about it, all right? Here, have a great person. <laughs> Don't move. Don't make any noise, okay? 
The intruder wore an executioner's hood, emblazoned on his robe, a sign of the Zodiac. Tie her up. What? Yeah, tie her up. Here, take my car keys, man. I don't. Once want again, to it was a young man who would survive. I'm an escaped convict from Deer Lodge, Montana, and I don't have much time. Deer Lodge, Montana. The Zodiac's mention of such an obscure town defied explanation until the capture of Ted Kaczynski at his cabin, just an hour's drive from Deer Lodge, Montana. Kaczynski had owned the cabin for 25 years. After his arrest, FBI agents cataloged Kaczynski's every possession, buttons to bomb parts. I would certainly have expected uh, to have found in the investigation at suspect Ted Kaczynski's cabin, something there that belonged to Zodiac. Now, suspect Ted Kaczynski kept everything. The hood, the sunglasses, bomb-making paraphernalia. He had a fetish for keeping these, what we call, souvenirs. Why wasn't there one shred of evidence in that cabin linking him to, to Zodiac? You guys, come here, come here. Look at this. As for the Zodiac himself, Teenage partygoers in San Francisco were the next to catch a glimpse of the furtive killer. It was October 11th, 1969, roughly two weeks after his last assault. It was a Zodiac's fifth known murder, an unarmed cab driver. However, a police dispatcher garbled the eyewitness description. Hey, buddy. You see anything suspicious around here in the last few minutes? As a result, police did not arrest the man they encountered less than a block from the murder scene. He was going uh, east on Washington. Thanks a lot. The man walked off into the night. Soon after, he sent a letter to a local newspaper. Inside was a blood-stained slice of the cab driver's shirt and a mocking letter describing the encounter with police. It was signed, the Zodiac. Authorities released this sketch of the suspect. Researchers Oswald and Moscone maintain that without glasses, the face is familiar, a young Ted Kaczynski. They both had a strong lower jaw with a cleft, small cleft in the chin. Both had a reddish tint to their hair, and they both were about 5'9". Also, the age given for the Zodiac Killer was between 25 years of age and 30 years of age. Theodore Kaczynski at that time was around 29 years old. After the cab driver murder, Zodiac announced a new M.O. Instead of guns and knives, he would now kill with bombs. He threatened to target a school bus filled with children and enclosed diagrams of complex triggering devices. Despite his threats, Zodiac did not bomb a single target. Indeed, he was never heard from again after his letter of April 1978. But one month later, the Unabomber attacks were underway. Had the Zodiac reinvented himself as an anti-technology warrior? I think it would be quite unusual to change your uh, M.O. like that, to go from different kinds of weapons to suddenly bomb making. I, I think there are a lot of interesting connections, but I do not believe they're the same. Zodiac is a confrontational killer, hands-on. He enjoys looking at his victims. He enjoys stabbing, shooting. So there's a marked difference there. Serial bombers, like suspect Ted Kaczynski, tend to be nerdy, cerebral. They enjoy killing from afar. It's been thought that Kaczynski was a mathematical nerd growing up, that he spent all his time with his nose in a book in a classroom. That's not true. Uh, he spent a great deal of time in the woods learning survival skills with his brother and his father. Uh, that's been brought out uh, by the FBI and by interviews with his brother since. So uh, we know that Kaczynski was familiar with weapons. He knew how to use them, and he was comfortable with them. I don't believe a confrontational serial killer, such as Zodiac, later on would become a serial bomber. When he mellowed out, when he became better educated, uh, settling back, now I'm going to play a new game with law enforcement. We rarely see that. Ted Kaczynski was 36 when the first Unabomber explosion occurred. Uh, the FBI was a little puzzled as to why somebody that age would want to begin on a career of serial murder. Usually it's much younger people who do. 
Uh, perhaps they didn't dream that he had had an earlier, more violent uh, period of murder and had mellowed out over the years, as serial killers are said to do if they're not caught. Rusconi and Oswell's theory prompted police to review their Zodiac case files, sifting for evidence against Theodore Kaczynski. Mr. Ted Kaczynski is not a viable suspect at this point as the Zodiac. We have not made any conclusion as to who the Zodiac was or is. Off the record, detectives specify one suspect among the more than 2,000 questioned in the case that they believe was a Zodiac. However, there was never enough evidence to make their suspicions stand up in court. The Zodiac has been silent now for almost 20 years. Is he still with us? Perhaps facts will emerge at the trial of Theodore Kaczynski that expose him as a Zodiac killer. Or perhaps the truth about the Zodiac will remain forever just out of reach. Next, two young coeds from opposite sides of the country mysteriously vanish. And later, do you believe in miracles? If you don't, Trish Zemba's recovery from a painful nerve disease might just convince you. Tim Harrow's a veteran journalist with a long list of credits, but one particular story had haunted him for years, his own, as told to him by his adoptive mother, Helen Harrow. In 1946, Helen was working as a nurse at a hospital in St. Louis, Missouri. She told Tim that she had found him abandoned in a trash can. She took him home and raised him as her own. Tim was still a boy when Helen told him that story. Because of it, Tim harbored a lifelong grudge against his birth mother, the woman he thought had thrown him away. By 1976, Tim was on staff of the Los Angeles Herald Examiner when he got a call out of the blue. City desk. May I speak to Tim Harold? Speaking, who's calling? This is your mother. Excuse me? What are you talking about? My mother's at home. This is your mother. Your real mother. All of a sudden, all the hatred just exploded. I said, how could you? How could you throw me away like I was a piece of garbage? How could you do that? And uh, she said, well, you don't understand. And I said, I don't want to understand. After Helen died, Tim began to reconsider. In 1990, on a trip back to St. Louis with his second wife, Tim tried to locate his birth mother through adoption records. Thanks to a helpful lawyer, Tim learned that everything Helen had told him had been a lie. His birth mother was Helen's own niece, and she had given Tim up because he needed medical care, care that Helen could provide. It went through me like a, a jolt of electricity. The only thought in my mind was, is I really wanted to find her now. I really wanted to say, look, I didn't know and I am so sorry. I am so sorry for what I said to you and, and how I acted to you. We may have lived in the St. Louis area. Tim Harold called on all his skills as a reporter to track his birth mother, but it was not until the night of our broadcast that he got the help he needed. Here's Keely Shea Smith with the tales of a reunion long overdue. Bob, one of the people watching our broadcast that night was a private investigator from Scottsdale, Arizona. Alice Simon volunteered her expertise and resources for Tim's search. Within one week, she telephoned Tim with extraordinary news. She called and she said, I just talked to your mother and you have a wonderful family. You have three sisters and a brother and scads of cousins and nephews and nieces and everything. And I just <laughs> broke down and cried. Tim's birth mother, Muriel Gartner, lives in Campbell, California. This past June, Muriel gathered her entire family to welcome Tim and his son, Adam, home at last. It feels 
right. It feels that like finally everything has come full circle. <laughs> this is your grandson. <laughs> oh. There's always been the hole, an empty hole. Though I've had a lot of other kids in a wonderful life, great kids. But it, it feels like this hole's beginning to feel, fill in now. This is your brother, Joe. Joe, how are you? Thank you. Welcome. Yeah, how's it going? Welcome, it's just the most amazing feeling in the world to know that I've got this family and that, that uh, I'm going to be a part of this family and, and that they're going to be a part of my life. And, I mean, I just can't tell you what the feeling is like. I was involved in it too. <laughs> He's just one of us. And, and, and it felt that way from the very beginning when he called me. He said, hello, mom, and I said, hello, son, and that was it. When we went to hang up, he said, can I call you again tomorrow, Mom? I've been wanting to call my mom for a long time, and I cried, and he cried. At this time every year, a familiar ritual plays out all across America. Kids head off to college. The last thing any parent imagines is that their child will go to school and vanish without a trace. But recently, the unimaginable is exactly what happened to 18-year-old April Gregory and 19-year-old Kristen Smart. April and Kristen never met. Indeed, they were enrolled at different universities on opposite sides of the country. Yet within the same five-hour period, they were both suddenly gone. No warning, no explanation. April Gregory took her schoolwork very seriously. She wrapped up freshman year at Syracuse University in New York and turned right around and enrolled in summer session. At 11.45 on May 24, 1996, April's brother Lamar dropped her off at her dorm Sadler Hall. I helped me with her bags to the front of the dormitory, and that was the last I saw her. The mystery begins. April walks up these steps, enters these doors under the watchful eyes of dorm officials, ascends to her seventh floor room. These are the meager facts. Later, police examine April's room. She is not completely unpacked. Was she interrupted? In the closet, a clue. April is employed at a local restaurant, and her work uniform is missing. This is a path April takes to her job. Did she even get this far? All we know is that April never arrived at work. Really did she miss work, very rarely. I just knew something bad had happened to my baby. Whatever happened, happened between midnight and 5 a.m. During that same time, 3,000 miles away, another young woman mysteriously disappeared. Kristen Smart, 19 years old, a freshman at Cal Poly State University in San Luis Obispo, California. About the time April Gregory should have been heading to work in New York, Kristen was walking along this road in California she was returning to her dorm after a party. She was not alone. Paul Flores, 19 years old, also a freshman at Cal Poly. He had offered to walk Kristen back to campus after the party. An eyewitness saw Paul and Kristen at this corner, roughly 200 yards from their dormitories. Paul told police that Kristen headed to her dorm, and he continued across the street alone to his. Kristen phoned home every Sunday religiously. And when that Sunday passed and she hadn't phoned, I knew something was wrong. Authorities agreed. 100 sheriff's deputies and 300 volunteers searched the campus for any trace of Kristen Smart. Results, negative. Search dogs, specially trained to recognize the odor of a dead human body, were taken through campus dorms. Experts say the only possible false positive is a scent of menstrual blood. Uh, those dogs uh, 
hit on this room, run, room 128 at the Cal Poly campus, and uh, specifically came into this room and hit on this mattress and the corner of this mattress. This room was occupied by, uh, coincidentally, the uh, male subject that was last seen uh, with uh, Kristen Smart on the day she became a missing person. That male subject was Paul Flores. Authorities began to question Flores' statement that he and Kristen had gone their separate ways once they arrived at the dorms. Toward their dorms. When they got to approximately here, he says he continued into his dorm, which is up the hill, and she left and went up between the two dorms to her dorm. However, we believe that based on what we've learned from the search dogs, she actually continued into his dorm with him. At this time, no criminal charges have been filed in the case. Kristen Smart is still considered a missing person. We never give up hope that Kristen will be found. But as any parent can imagine, the longer that it goes on, um, the dimmer the light. And we can only hope. Coming up, authorities need your help to track down a convicted killer. But first, in a remarkable story of faith and resilience, a young girl overcomes a painful nerve disorder. It was a normal Christmas Eve Western style. In Phoenix, Arizona, the sky was blue, the temperature a balmy 75. 14-year-old Trish Zemba saddled up her ex-race horse Sly and headed out for a ride. but I was in shock. I had so much adrenaline rushing through my system that what had just happened did not register with me at the moment. I helped her into the house. She was limping a little bit and uh, took her in and took everything off to look for broken bones. And she was scraped on the one side, somewhat scraped and it was red, like road rash and some bruising where you could tell there was gonna be bruising. The injuries appeared superficial. Trish improved overnight, and the incident had little impact on the family's Christmas Day plans. I got up, got myself dressed, came out, and basically spent all Christmas Day on the couch. I was sore, stiff, hobbled around some, but I was able to get around. The accident seemed like a thing of the past, until Trish was bathing some 10 days later. I remember I went to get up, and when I was standing up, I started feeling dizzy. I heard a thump and I called out to her and she didn't answer me. Trish. Trish. Trisha. Honey, wake up. Trish. Trisha. Joel. I was panicked when I saw Trisha passed out. I didn't know what had happened. I couldn't get a response out of her at first. I, I, I just didn't know what was going on. From there on, then she, her condition seemed to get worse. Uh, pain increased, uh, her mobility you know, started to be less, she had more trouble getting around and sitting. So that's when we started taking her to a round of doctors. The bathtub fall had triggered an avalanche of pain doctors could neither diagnose nor relieve. After five weeks of unrelenting agony, Trish was hospitalized. Can you tell me where it hurts? Does it hurt in your back? Does it hurt in your legs? 
She was in a lot of pain, so they started administering morphine. And they just kept giving it to her and giving it to her in large doses, and it wouldn't affect the pain. It did not help the pain at all. And finally, they had given her so much, they couldn't give her anymore without killing her. It was horrible seeing Tricia in this pain and not being able to do anything for her. And it was very, very scary until we would pray. Dear Jesus, we would just ask, Father, that you would reach down and lay your hands on Trisha, Father. Trish was racked by pain every waking hour. Her left leg alternately turned purple and then back to normal, grew hot and feverish, then icy cold. The diagnosis could hardly have been more frightening. Trish had a rare, often incurable nerve disease called reflex sympathetic dystrophy, or RSD. Dear Heavenly Father, we know that you This is by Trish. far the worst I had ever seen. And I was feeling pretty hopeless about her chances of getting any kind of a good recovery here. And I remember her mother being so strong in their faith, saying, we're going to see a miracle here before this is over. And I kept thinking, no, I don't think so. This videotape of Trish was made at the hospital where she was treated for RSD. Doctors believe the disease is produced by malfunctioning nerve circuits. The nerves endlessly amplify and reamplify pain sensations, making even a minor injury unremitting torture. She was literally writhing in pain, unable to have anybody touch or move her leg, her hip. If you even breathed on it or put a blanket over the skin, uh, she would just uh, jump. We continually gave her medication to try and basically numb her legs, the idea being that if we break the cycle, kill the pain, stop the cycle of pain from renegotiating itself, that the condition itself would disappear. <laughs> Doctors injected the most potent pain-killing drugs available directly into Trish's spinal column, but Trish hardly noticed. The RSD continued to worsen, and Trish's muscles began to weaken from disuse. They started telling us that they were going to have to institutionalize her, that most patients with RSD this bad either die from it or they commit suicide or, or they literally go crazy because they cannot live with this type of pain. Even in the face of such bleak predictions, Trisha's parents say they never lost faith. Countless times, each and every day, they turn to prayer. Grant her some peace and take away this pain so that she can rest, Father. We would pray, and again, that sense that things would be all right would come over us. And though Trisha would still be moaning and our circumstances didn't change, it was like things were all right. Trish's doctors were less optimistic. They proposed an operation usually reserved for terminal cancer patients, implanting a morphine pump into Trish's body. If it sufficiently dulled her pain, they could at least attempt physical therapy to slow the deterioration of Trish's leg muscles. That was our next step. That was really all that we had left to offer her. And quite frankly, what I foresaw was a long, painful route in rehab and with a very uncertain outcome as to whether this would ever resolve. Surgery loomed. Then early on the morning of March 11, 1994, the family's prayers were answered, suddenly and dramatically. I felt the pain in my body move down. And as it was moving down my ribs, I remember feeling what my ribs felt like. And I felt it keep on moving down and moving down. And then finally, I felt it move all the way down my leg. And I felt it exit through my toes. I felt it leave my body. And I heard very, very quietly, almost to the point where I couldn't hear it, get up. And I remember thinking, I can't get up. My, I'm physically unable to get up. And I heard, again, clear and more, a much more authoritative, get up. And I remember grabbing onto the side of the bed rail and beginning to sit up. And I was able to sit up like I would have in the past. I sat up and I was sitting on the edge of the bed. 
and the second I set my feet on the ground, I didn't have any pain anywhere in my whole body. I stood up and I remember I was standing there like, well, what now? <laughs> and I started walking. It was unbelievable to walk into her hospital room and see her standing there. She hadn't stood for two and a half months on her own. Um, tremendous relief and gratitude to God, who never let us down. He didn't ever let us down. As a medical physician, I have to go by the medical data. And the medical data has no explanation for this. On a purely personal basis, and based on my own religious beliefs, I feel that, yes, she did have a miraculous healing. We work in the world of science, but that does not mean it necessarily has to be mutually exclusive of the realm, if you will, of, of the spirit or of religion. And I think we work together uh, to create a, a successful end when the ends are successful. That same morning, Trish was released from the hospital Trisha's parents made this videotape soon after she arrived home. I know it was a miracle. The pain just left my body in one fell swoop. I felt like God was standing there, right there, just taking this pain from me and saying, you know, I love you so much, I just want to set you free. Spontaneous remission is virtually without precedent in acute cases of RSD. Medical science still cannot explain Trish Zemba's stunning turnaround. However, to Trish and her family, it is no mystery at all, just further evidence of the infinite power of faith. When we return, an abduction and murder leads to a wild shootout with the police. Most of us, 22 years seems like a long time. But when it comes to tracking down a ruthless killer who's escaped punishment, time doesn't matter. 22 years ago might just as well be yesterday. Take a ride at the next light. March 6, 1974, Sewanee, Georgia, 30 miles northeast of Atlanta. I just got my, uh, my check cashed. I've got $200 in my wallet. Just, just reach in the back. James Rouse Jr., a teacher, husband, and father of two young children, is abducted at gunpoint by two fugitives, William Jordan and Anthony Pravat. Jordan and Pravat were wanted in North Carolina for a series of burglaries. Make another right up here. Guys, you've got my keys. Turn around that way. You've got my money. The ride ended at the edge of a remote forest. The kidnappers forced Rouse to go barefoot and marched him into the woods. I don't even know who you are. Keep walking. I'm not going to find out. When they reached the shore of a deserted lake, they stopped. Guys. James Rouse died instantly, shot at point blank range with a sawed off shotgun. The next day, Wadesboro, North Carolina, 240 miles from Suwannee. That's it over there, 421. Police got an anonymous tip that Jordan and Pravat were back in town, hiding at the home of a friend. You recognize that car? Nah, it doesn't look familiar to me. We knew who we were looking for. We were looking for two guys, last name of Pravat and Jordan. They had a reputation of being bad guys, uh, predominantly in the property theft, house break in those type of things. We didn't uh, really suspect that they were involved in anything serious uh, other than that. The officers approached the house, fully expecting to make an arrest, but Jordan and Pravat were one step ahead. Sheriff's Office 107 in pursuit of suspects traveling east on Highway 117. Suspects are firing upon us, requesting backup. Everything was happening so fast, 
but it seemed extreme that these guys were using this much excessive force to get away from us just because we wanted to talk to them about some house break ins. Get a shot, get a shot at him. Suspects has thrown out what looks like to be a weapon just past Olivet Church. I'll get up alongside of it. Twenty-four-year-old Anthony Pravat and thirty-one-year-old William Jordan were booked on charges of breaking and entering, larceny, and assaulting officers with a firearm. Police in North Carolina still didn't know that the two men were killers. Forty-eight hours later, the body of James Ross Jr. was discovered in Georgia. It was his stolen car that Jordan and Pravat had crashed in Waysboro. It didn't take long piece together the rest. A shotgun shell found at the murder scene further damned Jordan and Prevent. Ballistics tests reveal Rouse had been killed with a blast from the shotgun dumped during the chase. Finally, and most chilling of all, police in North Carolina found arrogant trophies of murder inside the wrecked car. Photographs of Jordan and Prevent leaning against Rouse's car and posing proudly with a shotgun that killed him. They were both eventually extradited back to Georgia. They were both tried, both found guilty of first-degree murder, both given uh, death, they were given the death sentence. However, neither Jordan nor Pravat stayed long on death row. Upon review by the Georgia Supreme Court, they felt there were some prejudicial comments made by the district attorney in his closing argument that lifted the burden of the decision from the jury, and it was reversed, and their sentences commuted to life. In 1991, Pravat was paroled, but was returned to prison after he murdered his girlfriend. Pravat is currently on death row in North Carolina. The story of William Jordan, however, has yet to end. Jordan? You and Green take the truck on back to the house, gas it up. Make yourself useful. Yes, sir. After 10 years of good behavior, Jordan had been assigned to a minimum security work farm in Odom, Georgia. But his image as the model prisoner proved false. William Jordan just kept driving. A month later, police caught the inmate who escaped with him. Jordan has eluded capture ever since. Jordan was possibly seen in 1992 in Virginia. He possibly works in Virginia or West Virginia as a heavy equipment operator. He also possibly has a family in West Virginia. He uses the name William Bill Jordan or William Junior Jordan. It's been more than 20 years since Jordan and Pravat heartlessly murdered James Rouse Jr. But the Rouse family still feels the pain. The hardest part has been not only the way it happened, but certainly the fact that he has not been with us and been able to enjoy his own family. We have lived through years of anger for what Jordan did to my brother-in-law, Jim, and what it has done to the children as well as to his wife. This is how William Jordan looked in 1974, the year he murdered James Rouse. This photograph, the last known taken of Jordan, shows how he looked in 1979. Computer aging shows how he might look today at the age of 54. William Jordan is six feet, two inches tall, has brown graying hair, and probably wears glasses. Jordan has several distinctive tattoos, a skeleton on his right forearm, a spider on his right upper arm, a cross with the name Sybil on his left forearm, 
and the name Louise on his left leg. Join me next time for another intriguing edition of Unsolved Mysteries.